This is a story about a series of murders and disappearances that happened in the winter of 2000. This is A New Winter. A friend of mine suggested that I tell this story on a podcast. I was going to write a book about it, but she says that this is a better way of telling the story, and that maybe hearing it from the horse's mouth might give it more weight and credibility. Because, well, because this is a story about what happened over the winter of 2000 in a small countryside town where I grew up. I can't tell you the exact name of the town because, well, I don't want to get anyone in trouble, or worse yet, danger. But this is about a strange series of murders and disappearances that you wouldn't have read about in the media or heard anything about because of one simple reason. And that's no one wants you to know about it. I just want you to know that as I talk on here, I'm giving you my account from what I remember firsthand. I'll try and get the details right. I'll try and remember the exact words that people used. But the truth is, well, the truth is some of it is hazier than others. But the important details, well, I can remember those. The timeline might jump around a bit, and you'll see why. But I want you to experience my journey firsthand. Know what I went through. Perhaps react the same way that I reacted. And you can come to your own conclusions. If some things seem too fantastical to believe, then maybe there is another explanation, but I can't think of one. I've babbled too long now, but I think I should start with how it all started. And that's at the Stockwell family farm on a cold, harsh, snowy winter. The Stockwells, so you know, were Father Tim, 51, and Mother Lauren, 48, both of whom worked on the farm. Their daughter, Kate, who was 17, and their little brother, Michael, who was just 10 years old. So let's begin with the facts. The stock wheels were murdered, one by one, in their barn, over the course of three days. They walked into there, one by one, of their own accord it seemed, and at separate times over the three day period. There were no signs of struggle, but the bodies were horribly mutilated. Tortured, it seemed, but I'll come on to that later. And in the case of the mother Lauren and daughter Kate, There have been signs of sexual activity. When the police finally arrived, apart from the bodies, the only evidence they could find was one set of footprints, not belonging to the victims, but leaving the nearby forest at the edge of the farm and entering the barn. The strange thing being that there was nothing leaving the premises, which meant, in theory, whomever did it was still there, somewhere, if it was whoever those prints belonged to anyway. And that was it. They were the first murders, the ones that I knew of. And it's with them that this story starts. Now, as a town, we had heard the rumours. Mr Stockwell had gone crazy and done it himself. Maybe it was a wild animal or a homeless man that they'd given shelter to, but perhaps had more macabre plans. Maybe it was a mass suicide. The Stockwells were notoriously religious and... This was at a time where, because of the millennium, there were a lot of cults around and end-of-the-world stuff flying about. But none of that rang true for me. You see, Kate, the daughter, well, she was a good friend of mine. I'd often gone round to their place to hang out, and we had been physically intimate. Often, in fact. But I would never have called us a couple. There's also something making me feel uneasy about the murders. Like... Maybe it was just being made up, set up by the town for something like a, just a simple disappearance. Why? Well, I don't really know. I just had a hard time with believing it. I first heard about it from a friend of mine called Rich. He wasn't the most reliable of sources, but 
It passed down the grapevine pretty quick from others. But none of us understood why it hadn't been in the papers at all. And until then, until I saw it in black and white in front of me, then in my head it just wasn't real. Social media wasn't even a thing back then. And even the internet was quiet about it. So what had happened? Where was Kate? And was she really dead? I was still calling her, but all I got was a bog-standard automated voicemail reply. I was sure that this was all just some nonsense. That was until, while I was watching TV with my brother, there was a knock on the door. I heard a few murmurs, expecting it to be one of Mum's friends, until Mum came in, ghostly pale, and told me the police wanted to talk to me. Selfishly, the first thing that I thought of was, well, what had I done illegally lately? The list was pretty small, to be honest. Not that I was a good boy or a bad boy, but I drank a lot. I smoked a lot of dope and I was using cocaine, but never really considered myself an addict. It was all fun and I thought I was just a rock star. But when I walked into the kitchen, my mum serving them up cups of tea in her best mugs, half-eaten packets of McVitie's and a stale jam donut that nobody wanted, or would ever want, to be honest, it suddenly became all too real. And I knew, I knew then it was about Kate. When I walked in and saw the policeman, I don't know, I, I just thought they'd be dressed in lousy suits or something like that. But they were dressed in just regular police gear, like an everyday Bobby walking down the streets. One male, the other female. Both looked like in their thirties, very plain looking, almost emotionless. The girl just staring at me almost the whole time. To the police, at that point, I guess I was a suspect. But that didn't occur to me until later. I was living with my mum and a typical 17-year-old. I'd been out in the town on many occasions. They never directly said that I was a suspect, but I guess they must have looked into this at some point because they started by saying they'd spoken to a few people. They'd heard that I was close with Kate. And there it was. Past tense. When I asked what had happened... They said that she'd been found with the rest of the family in their barn and had sadly been murdered. So any information I could give to them would be crucial. So I should just pause here as this had a huge effect on me, on my life, on my mental well-being and what would occur from here on outwards. When I heard that about Kate, it was scary. I don't know if something like this has happened around you or worse yet to you, but it's quite hard to actually imagine that this person that you knew, their face, their speech, their smile, all that had gone through this horrific experience. You don't think when you're out at the pub or lying around in bed together that there's a slightest possibility that they would meet such an end, this other person. We're all hoping that you know we're going to die old in our own beds, peacefully in our sleep, surrounded by the ones that we love. But the sad truth is that it doesn't happen to everyone. I remember quite vividly my mum listening in from outside the door. She was always terrible at trying to hide how bloody nosy she was, but I didn't mind. The truth was that I just hadn't spoken to Kate for some time. I mean, there was no fallout. Well, as far as I know, she hadn't been acting strangely or anything. It's just that, you know, over the last few months, we sort of lost touch, like people do. They asked me if I thought that this might have had anything to do with anything in particular, any event or relationship or anything like that. And I told them, well, if there was, I, I just didn't know about it. The whole process, interview as it were, it didn't take long. I told them where I'd been places, times. I offered them my phone to look through my texts, which they did, briefly. I could tell in their eyes that the case clearly wasn't going too well, that maybe I'd been their golden egg, a young, jilted lover who's planned his revenge, but I just wasn't like that, especially back then. I just wanted, well, I just wanted an easy life. I was happy with friends, brushed off any negativity, really. I was doing okay at school, you know, not great, but okay. I was starting to form friendships that 
well, some of which would continue to this day. And I was happy. There's no way I'd jeopardise that. And I just had a wandering eye for, well, women. Was I obsessed with Kate? No way. But, well, I guess someone could be. I should tell you a bit more about her, I guess. Well, from what I remember. I hope I don't do her too much of a disservice when I say that she was cute and everything, but she was simple. Her parents knew how to run a farm and, and that was it. And even though she would try really hard at school, she just found it difficult to learn anything, just slightly academic. The one thing that she did love was clothes. I hate to say it, but it was a typical girly thing. And she started to get into that whole phase of thinking a pop guitar group, a, a rock group. It's sweet, but for me, she just had she just had nothing to offer. In terms of her looks, she had long, wavy red hair. Uh, she had a small, dimpled face. And she had these big, anime-style eyes. I mean, there's no doubt that she was pretty. The only thing that would drive me mad was her voice. I found it quite high and whiny, often going up at the end of sentences like she was asking a question all the time. For me, it just... It just looked like every other girl that walks down the high street in those packs, like air-headed, gossip, infatuated clones. But then, to me, she was a kid. Well, so was I. I thought I was extremely cool, and too much for this small town. But when I finally moved to London, the big city, it was clear that I needed to re-evaluate myself, and once I was able to get the events of, well, that period of time out of my head then finally I was able to move on but back to my mum's kitchen in the year 2000 it wasn't a long interview it was probably less than an hour and I gave them some other names of mutual friends but near the end of the talk they suddenly wanted to know more about Kate's dad Tim in hindsight I guess he would be the prime suspect well until the other murders came in that winter but the guy was never really there I mean Not when I was there anyway, thank God. From Kate, it sounded like he was a devout Christian who would often just blow up about nothing. I think he was probably just old and tired, done with the farming life. Maybe he was just unhappy. It probably didn't help his case with my completely uninformed opinion of him, but I was just trying to help and I was answering honestly. And then that was it, they got up and left. And I just sat there, not really quite sure what to do. My mum made me a cup of tea, but she didn't say a word. I just sat and watched TV with my brother until I got tired and went to bed. There was some scuffling downstairs, but just before I got into bed, I checked my phone and saw that I got a text. It was a girl I knew, Jackie, asking if I was still up and if I could drive over. Well, of course, I thought I was about to jump into another bed. When I asked why... The reply wasn't what I'd expected. I looked down and had to read it a couple of times. It simply said, It's about Kate. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. For more info, including how you can support the show, please visit anewwinter.com. Music today was by Kevin MacLeod, Purple Planet Music and We Talk of Dreams. Thank you for listening to a new winter.